Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Here. Ms. Casalonis? Here. Ms. Layton? Here. Mrs. Lindstrom? Here. Mrs. Scyther? Here. Mrs. Turner? Here. Mr. Bennett? Here. And Ms. Giftos? Okay, can we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That brings us to agenda item 4.0, the presentation of our school board workshop. And I'd like to welcome Eileen King. Hi everyone. It's it's really nice to be back. As I said, with I was chatting with some of you, it's, it's like old home week. Um, uh, if, if before we get going, I do believe there's some new board members and I do, I kind of met the new student rep. So if we could just do introductions, um, April, that would be helpful. <coughs> Absolutely, I think that's a fantastic idea. Um, probably the best way. There we go. Is if we'll, I'll just start with who I can see. Um, so if Shannon, you want to just introduce yourself first, please. Sure. Hi, Eileen. My name is Shannon Lindstrom. Um, I just started. This is my first year, so I'm one of the new. The new board members it was just elected in november and i'm happy to be here thanks for doing this well thank you for running for school board <laughs> absolutely alicia hi Eileen. my name is alicia giftus hi alicia sarah hi eileen uh, sarah leighton hi sarah good to see you again you too kristen Hi, I'm Kristen Turner. I've been on the board about a year, so I don't think we've met. No, oh, hi, Kristen. Nice to meet you. Gabby? Hi, I'm Gabby Giftis. You're not related to anyone on the screen, are you? <laughs> um, um, I was just elected as the student junior representative. Congratulations, Gabby, thank and you. thank you for doing that. That's awesome. Me? Oh, sorry. I, I, I didn't hear that. I just heard an ick at the end. So I was like, I don't think, I think that's me. So I'm, uh, I'm Nick Gill. Eileen, we've met before, of course, and uh, I'm in year three. Hi, Nick. Good to see you again. You too. And last but certainly not least, Max. Hi, I'm Max. I've, um, I'm the senior board rep and I'm a little, I've been here a little over a year. So thank you so much for coming. It's great to meet you. And Max, once again, thank you for serving on the board. It's oh, much appreciated. It's That's my awesome. pleasure. Max, Max and Gabby, thank you so much. What a great, great opportunity for you guys to have input into what's going on from your perspective in the school. So, oh, totally. I could not be happier to be here. So thank you so much for coming. And uh, hi to my buddies, Sandy and Diane. <laughs> Good hi, to see Emily. you guys. Nice to have you here. So, uh, and I do know Leanne, we didn't introduce her, but- um, I'm back. <laughs> sorry, I lost sorry. the internet. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Like I know Leanne. That was... <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> so um, Diane, if we can go back to sharing the screen, I'll go ahead and get going. Um, so tonight, uh, we're looking at uh, really going uh, to uh, uh, talking about uh, main school management. My name is Eileen King. I'm the deputy executive director of main school management. I'm also the executive director of the main school superintendents association. And tonight, uh, we're going to talk about who we are in slide two, um, who you are, and what's in your packet. And the one of the things I want to talk about and I know you receive these, a lot of these things um, electronically. I don't know if you printed things out or not. So I wanna try to 
organize this so that it's you're not trying to find handouts and everything. I'm going to refer to policies. We're going to work off the slide deck. I'll refer to policies um, that you may want to go back and review because I've aligned all of your policies to this presentation. But usually we are sitting in a room together and I have you pull out your paper packets and I say, we're going to, you know, the left side is the PowerPoint and the right side is your handout. And uh, because it's all electronic, um, we're just going to work off of the PowerPoint. Uh, and I will refer to policies that at some point you might want to go back and, re and review as a board together. Um, but what we're really going to do is really, really focus on the roles and responsibilities of school board members. I'm going to touch uh, uh, on the law a little bit as, refer as it refers to uh, how you actually are as an elected official um, and, uh, and really talk about how you function as a team uh, as a board member. But in your packet, when you do have time to, to pull this up, there is a uh, brochure that says MSBA brings school boards together. And it's just a little brochure that looks like this. And what I want to do is I want to talk about the work that uh, Maine School Boards Association has been doing under the direction of their executive director, Steve Bailey. There are nine uh, school, uh, school board regions that mirror the nine superintendent regions. And you are in region uh, York, right? You're in region nine. Uh, um, and I think it's, yes, it, it is. Wait a minute. I think we're seven, Eileen. You are, yes, you are region, you're Cumberland. You're in region seven. And um, what Steve has been doing since we've all become comfortable with Zoom is he create, he uh, schedules meetings with board members from your regions uh, two or three times a year, just to come together and talk about current practices, things that are going on in your area and letting, getting board members to get to know each other uh, what, and, and talking about some of the current events that are going on. So I believe there's gonna be another slate of meetings coming up um, and your, um, your representative uh, is Mara Pillsbury from Free, uh, Freeport. She's a, a board of directors from Freeport. And then you also have Jim Grant from Brunswick and John Jones from, um, uh, he's, a, uh, from he's an at-large director. But these meetings are to bring board members together. You usually quite often have about 20 to 25 board members from your region. And it's a great chance for you to get to know what your neighbors are doing. We tried doing this before, but you know when travel's involved, sometimes it's just, becomes um, you know, not as easy to do as when you can sit on the computer at, at nighttime at, from six to you know, 7.15 on a Zoom meeting. So I wanted to point that out and hopefully the next time that's scheduled, you can certainly maybe jump on and get to know some of your neighboring board members and some of the issues that they're dealing with. So tonight, and if you have any questions, raise your hands. I can't see all of you. I can see part of you, but um, just, you know, once again, and I said to April, I know I talk fast. April thinks I'm going to get through 46 slides in a half hour. I'm not that good, um, but I'd be happy to answer questions. And once again, if I don't have the answer, I will certainly look into it tomorrow morning and get back to April and Sandy with, um, with whatever question I might have not been able to answer for you. So um, if you, for the new board members, um, Main School Management Association is um, the, I call it the founding uh, organization that supports the Main School Boards Association and the Main School Superintendents Association. So we have a lot of MSMAs, MSSAs, MSBAs, but um, MSMA really is the founding organization that supports those two, two uh, school boards association and superintendent association. We are actually the only structure like this in the country. Um, and we find that it works quite well because Steve and I truly are partners in the work that we do. And we work closely together to support each other in each other's organizations. Um, so uh, just so you kind of have an idea of what MSMA means and then and what its function is. So tonight we're going to talk about the um, school boards in Maine, we're going to review the roles and responsibilities um, and uh, talk about using strategic plans, um, goals, effective board governance, and really how to create strong and effective procedures and protocols. 
Um, given these purposes, um, please feel free to ask questions, uh, to uh, jot some questions down. Uh, and as usual, uh, when I attend a presentation, my best questions come, I'm gonna say on the ride home or on the walk downstairs or the walk into the kitchen, but certainly please feel free to send me any questions that you have after that. So probably the most important thing is all board members on slide five, they campaign, you campaign as individuals. So um, Shannon, when you, when you campaign to be on the school board, you campaigned as an individual to serve as a member of the team. However, when you come on the board, you are a member of the team. You're no longer an individual. And I think one of the things that's hardest for board members to understand, and I think some of the board members that have been with on the board, and if I look at two years ago, we, I think it was just two years ago, we did this, um, this presentation. It, it's a hard concept that board members have no authority as individuals. So the only time you have authority is when you are sitting in the boardroom at a publicly announced meeting as a board member. And that's the only time you have authority. And that's hard for new board members to, to really understand. And it's also hard for the public to understand because when they see you out and about, they see April, oh, that's right, she's on the board. And there's always that kind of connection between um, you, know, you as an, as an individual and but also you as a board member. So it's really important to realize that um, you have no authority outside um, of the boardroom. And the third thing that I want to emphasize is the success as a board member is tied to the success of the board. So coming to board member uh, meetings prepared, coming with an open mind, um, coming without having made decisions prior to a presentation, um, you know, coming ready to listen to all the facts and all the um, different items that are brought to your attention and listening to each other. The successful board uh, really is based on your board working as a team, your board um, being able to agree to disagree, which is going to happen in every board, and also you, your board uh, being prepared and, and really focused on your most uh, important asset are the children of your community. So it's really important that if you uh, strive to be a successful board member, um, it, it's also tied to being a successful board. Um, school committee in Maine, uh, they're governing bodies for school administrative units, and you do have statutory powers and responsibilities that are provided through Title 20A MRSA Section 1. And this is in one of your, this is going to be in your handouts, and I'm going to review some of the highlights of the powers of board, uh, board powers and responsibilities. Number one, and that's um, not that one quite yet. Um, yeah, well, I'll get to that in a minute, Kelly. Uh, I'm sorry, um, D Diane. So this is a handout, so it's not in your packet. So it's a separate, it's a separate handout in your email. But your most important is the board's responsibility for the development and adoption of policies upon the recommendation of your superintendent and for the employment of the superintendents. And let me talk about policies. Policies are the are, are uh, uh, adopted by school boards, and I, I refer to them as your owner's manual. We're going to talk about your job description tonight, and we're going to talk about your owner's manual on how you run your dis district. And your policies um, really describe how you're going to handle situations, how you're going to address issues, um, and they really talk about kind of the owner's manual of your district. One thing I want to point out is that policies, you don't choose to follow them. You don't choose to follow half of them. Uh, and you don't choose not to follow them. The best thing any board can do and, and every, every, any superintendent can do is to just follow your policies. Um, they were adopted by the board. Um, and once they're adopted after first reading and then second reading, you, you are required to follow those policies and not, not veer off when it's convenient or not, not follow them when it's convenient. So legislative policy is part of your, uh, your legislative powers and duties. Uh, you're responsible for acquiring reliable information from responsible resources. Let me go back and say that. Acquiring reliable information from responsible resources um, that will help you make the very best possibilities about uh, the scope and nature of the educational program. 
Um, you're also responsible for monitoring and evaluating and reporting the results for the educational programs. And I'm gonna say based on data from re reliable sources and, um, and re reliable information. The other thing you do is you employ personnel. Um, the superintendent will employ subject to the final approval of the board, the staff necessary for carrying out the instructional and support programs. Uh, you will serve as quasi-judicial and I'll get, there's another slide further down, I'll get to that in a little bit. You're responsible and although the statute says for preparing and presenting a budget, uh, you have a staff that prepares, you have a staff that presents, uh, your job is to really approve the budget based on the data that's been brought forward. Your job is to ask the good questions and to ask for supporting data. So you have a staff that does that, but your job is to ultimately bring a budget to the community that meets the needs of and the goals of the school district. Overseeing school facilities and, and then once again, communicating with the public and uh, the board is required to provide adequate communication and a direct means for keeping the public informed about their schools. Um, I will talk about this a little bit later on. Usually the spokesperson for the board is the board chair. Uh, you should only have one spokesperson uh, because the message that you need to send out to your public needs to be a consistent message uh, that is consistent with whatever issue or situation you're dealing with. Um, if you have a lot of different spokespersons, quite often a lot of different messages are sent out and then the community is saying, well, wait a minute, one person said this, one person said that. So you really wanna make sure that you align uh, your uh, messaging through your board chair with the support of the superintendent. When there needs to be a message, the superintendent and the board chair should be getting together. Should, they should be talking about what are going to be our talking points how are we going to support this with data? What do we need to be saying? Superintendent and board chair need to be having the same message. That way the community hears the same message coming out from the school committee and that they're not left to question why there may be a different message. Um, the next slide is also your, um, your slide and, and you can uh, make that a little bit bigger is um, your slide uh, BBA. So this is a policy. So a policy means you're required to file this. For the new board members, what I would do is I would get into your policy section B, because it really does talk about your roles and responsibilities as a board member. So the powers and duties of the board uh, will be confirmed and prescribed by law. Um, and I think I've just talked about um, the uh, statute that I just went over, um, the six major components of the responsibilities of board members. Uh, you're responsible for the management of schools. You'll adopt and direct the general course of study based on reliable information from responsible resources. And I'm gonna say that again and again, because you always wanna make sure you're basing your decisions on the best data that comes from your, your, your school leadership team and, and comes from your curriculum coordinator and comes from data from testing. However, your data is presented to you, you want it to be responsible and reliable. Um, and then you're also in the, in, uh, uh, in the interpretation of the powers and duties of the board, uh, you are the governing body of, in, in the determination of the general policies for the control, operation, maintenance, and expansion of the public schools. When I say the governing body, that means you're going to ensure the schools are well run. That's your job. Superintendent and your assistant superintendent run the schools. And that's a very, very clear delineation. The school board ensures that the schools are well run. And then the superintendent, the assistant superintendent uh, run the schools. And then that supports, 4.0 supports what I just said is the board of education will delegate administrative matters to the superintendent. So this is a policy. Um, it's re you are required to follow this policy. Now, when you come across policies that you don't uh, like or may be old or maybe need to be updated, there is a procedure for updating policies. But until those policies are updated, this is a policy you are required to follow based on your policy, policy governance. Um, and that's probably one of the most important things you do uh, is, is developing and adopting policy. So effective boards, kind of to summarize, um, understand there's no authority except when acting as part of the majority of the board. Now, are there exceptions to this? Yes, there are. For example, uh, if you go into negotiations, 
you may have a negotiating team and you may have two members of the school board representing the school board in negotiations. You're gonna send them with authority. You're going to nominate them as part of the, the uh, board's bargaining team. Um, you're going to send them with parameters in which they can bargain. You can't say you have to land here, here, and here. You're gonna say, we want you to land within these, these, these parameters, but they at that point have authority to represent you and, and they do have authority as a board member in that setting. That's, there are very other, there are very few uh, rare instances when um, a board member would have any authority except when acting as part of the majority of the board. And then I said, when the board, but by votes, delegates authority to him or her. So, um, and I think the um, negotiations uh, example is probably the, the, the clearest one that I can, can give. So um, the next slide um, is also kind of a difficult concept. And this was a um, memorandum that came out and I'm not gonna read through the whole thing. I'll summarize it for you. But basically um, what it says is the school committee acts as a public board. Um, and, in, and this is where this becomes hard. It in no sense represents the town, the members you know, its members are chosen by the voters of the town, but after election, they are public officers deriving their authority from the law responsible to the state for the good faith and rectitude of their acts. So where did this come from? And I know it's back in 1924 and people say, oh, that was a long time ago. That doesn't, that doesn't pertain anymore. But in January 3rd of 2020, we did have our assistant attorney general take a look into the law to see where this still pertained. And what happened in 1924 is that um, there was an orphan and I had an issue to do with an orphan uh, to attend school in the town where the guardian resided. And the school committee denied uh, this child access to the school because among other things, they felt that there are too many wards of the state uh, being placed in their town and that was posing an unequal burden to, that the town should not be obligated to bear. I'm assuming it was an unequal financial burden, but I haven't, I, I haven't clarified that. So the law court in ordering the student to be admitted held that the school committee was obligated to follow the law. So the law at that time is still the law now that you must attend school in the town where you reside. But in 1924, this town said, we have too many wards of the state, it's an unequal burden, and therefore we're going to deny this child access to our, 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 our town. And this law is now, this, this case is still now upheld um, by our, our attorney general saying that school boards are required to follow the statutes and the law at, and, and, that are prescribed in law and the, and the legislative decisions that are made uh, by the education committee. That's hard because, because sometimes you don't agree with them. Sometimes the community members don't agree with them and don't want you to follow them. But this case, the Shaw case does require you to follow the law. So I, I do bring this out because I think sometimes board members might feel that tug of war between what community members feel and what the law says. And I wanna just make it crystal clear that, that you are required to follow the laws um, that are, um, that are adopted by the education committee and that are in statute. So this is something you might want to take a look at um, uh, at some point. Just it's I, I I guess I need a life. I think it's interesting reading, but um, uh, I think it's it it, it does it, it does summarize succinctly what your powers and responsibilities are. So the next slide talks about some more of your roles and responsibilities. Make sure I. Uh, um, so the school, so the, the, the most important relationship a school board has and the only employee the school board has is your superintendent. Um, other than that, um, that is your one employee. So the school board goal is to set, is sets the vision or the big picture. Um, that's based on reliable data from responsible sources, resources. Um, you help to set where you want to go as a school board based on the law, based on the statutes. You um, have the vision of performance goals, possibly. You have your supporting policies and you help provide the resources through uh, adopting a budget and bringing that to your, your town council. The superintendent works more on the operational side. So if you set the big picture, the superintendent's going to decide how are we going to get there? 
So, um, and, and, and who's gonna be involved and what are we gonna have to do to get there? And, um, and then if you look at your performance goals, uh, what are the staff goals? So what is the action plan? So what, are the staff, what does the staff have to do to get to where we wanna go? Uh, how, does, how does the superintendent report the progress of, of the, the journey of where you wanna go? And, and, the, and um, the superintendent is held accountable for getting to the big picture, but also holding the staff accountable for getting there as well. So I, the other thing is the um, uh, responsibilities of the school board and the superintendent. Uh, the school board selects the superintendent, you set policy, you adopt budget, and you act as a court of appeals. And I will get to that in a minute. Um, the superintendent selects staff recommends and implements policy. So a lot of the policies that come through uh, quite often will come to the superintendent uh, based on statute, based on a new law, uh, based on a change at the federal level, like the Title IX uh, policies that we all just went through and, and, and adopted and, and had our training on this, this summer. Um, and so, um, and quite often superintendents will take their policies to their administrative team because nine times out of 10 is the administrators that have to uphold the policies and they have to follow the policies. So quite often you're looking for input from your administrative team on the policies on what would work in your district, what wouldn't work. Uh, and then once that's done, they bring it to the board saying, this is what we think would be um, work well in our school district. Um, so they'll rec so recommend you guys adopt the policies in two, two readings and the superintendent will implement the policy and we'll see that the, the policies are followed. The superintendent also proposes and administrator, administers the budget. So the superintendent will come to you with a proposed budget. That's when you ask the questions, that's where you ask for the, ups, the um, supporting data. And once that budget is adopted by you, adopted by your community, then it's the superintendents and his business office um, that's in charge of administering the budget. And then all of the, ac the actions of the superintendent are based on policy. Um, and that's, that's because that is kind of, as I said, your owner's, owner's manual. So the three primary functions was I've talked about as legislative is your adoption of policy, uh, providing orderly operations of the school districts and you know, actually exercising due diligence, um, reading, uh, research, talking uh, to help you make decisions. Once again, I'm gonna say responsible and reliable resources and data um, because that's the best way to make the best decisions um, that to support your students. The next role, which is one I don't, uh, one I hope you don't have very often or if at, at all, uh, is quasi-judicial, and this is dealing with a personnel dismissal, a student expulsion, uh, proceedings of records, um, and just remember that everything can, or sub, can it, everything in this area is subject to review at the Supreme Court level. And I'm going to focus on the first two. If you get into a quasi-judicial area. Basically, what would happen is a superintendent would call the board chair and say, I have a situation, I have an issue, um, and we're, we're, uh, we're going to um, maybe uh, have a dismissal, uh, a personnel dismissal, after years of documentation, um, and after having done due diligence, we're at the point now where we realize we're going to have to follow the dismissal procedure. Um, quite often that teacher, or in this case, um, if you're looking at student expulsion, they'll be, re be represented by their own counsel. You'll have your own counsel and the rest of the board is really gonna be act acting as judge and jury. So there are times when the board chair is going to have more information uh, where the board won't have as much information because we don't wanna, we don't, we wanna leave you unbiased. Um, and so when you hear the facts, we don't want you, we don't want anyone to say that you've been swayed because you had data and information ahead of time. So that's when you fall into a quasi judicial and that's when the board would act as really judge and jury in dismissal hearings and student and, and expulsion um, hearings as well. The third is the executive is the authority to enter into a contract like you do with your uh, collective bargaining contracts approving purchases, which you do uh, when you sign the warrants um, and employing uh, persons. And so once again, the, uh, your superintendent will, will um, nominate um, a staff member or an individual for employment and, and then the, you will hire and then the superintendent will offer the contract. That's how the hiring process 
um, happens. You will vote to approve the nomination and then the superintendent will provide, will offer the contract. Um, you will delegate authority to the superintendent to carry out functions. And once again, um, you are required to establish a budget uh, with spending categories uh, based on the cost centers um, each year. And, and that's something that I, I know that you've been doing. So these are the three primary functions of the board members. Number one is the one you do the most, legislative. Uh, number two is the one you do almost as much. And number three, I hope you don't have much experience with. Next one, please. So the board superintendent relationship, uh, and this is a sample policy that I put in the packet. At some point, you might wanna review this. It's sample policy BDD. Um, and it basically believes, uh, the board believes that exercising its legislative function through policymaking is the most important responsibility. I think I've pretty much hit on that policymaking is probably the most important thing because it really describes the orderly uh, procedures of how your district will be run. Um, I think uh, the next paragraph, the second paragraph, it says the management of the schools is the function of the superintendent. And I think that's a very important uh, point to reiterate again that your job is to see that the schools are well run and the uh, but it's the superintendent's job to run the schools. Um, obviously, you're going to hold the superintendent responsible for complying with all laws and, and policies and regulations. Um, but um, as, as you look further down the board collectively uh, and as individual members shall recognize the superintendent as the educational leader provide direction for the superintendent through written policies, um, give the superintendent full administrative authority, obviously hold all uh, board members in public and in the presence of the superintendent, except as otherwise permitted by law, uh, refer complaints, criticisms, and requests to the superintendent or other appropriate personnel, and discuss them at board meetings only when all other solutions have been exhausted. And we'll talk about handling a public uh, concerns and complaints in a little bit. And then evaluate the superintendent and provide appropriate opportunities for the superintendent to also share his um, perception regarding the work and relationship with the school board. Um, the best schools are run when there is a really, really strong trusting relationship between the superintendent and the school board. And that this board trusts the superintendent is carrying out their functions and carrying out um, the goals of the district and following policy and the superintendent is, is given the authority to run the district. And the superintendent also trusts that the board is, is doing their work as a school board and working together as a team and actually putting the, the interests of the students at, at the forefront of all this, the decisions they're making. And just a small word about micromanaging. Um, I wanna just go back and say you're a team. Uh, all of you as of the board, you're an elected team um, and, and taking time to control every part, however small of, of, of the school district is, is not your role. Everything that you should be doing um, should be done from a team perspective, from a team view and, and working together based on policy, based on the goals that you've set um, and, 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 and moving forward that way as, as, a, as, a, as a team. The next, um, the next policy I want to refer to is your, your uh, policy, your code of ethics, and this is your policy BCA. Um, this is a really important policy. And I think it's, is it in the next one? It's next slide. Yes, thanks, Diane. Um, I think probably all your policies are important, but this one I always want to hold up just a little bit shinier and, and, and really spend a little bit of time on. You've accepted the challenge of serving on the school board. Um, and I think the last sentence in the first, and you know, to help provide free and public education to the children of Scarborough. I think the next sentence, now this is a policy, each board member will. It doesn't say shall, it doesn't say would be nice if they did. It says each board member will. So once again, I call this your job description. So as a board member, what are you required to do by the policy that a board, your board has developed or a prior board has developed? So viewing the service on the board is an opportunity to serve the community, state, and nation. 
um, thinking of children first um, and basing your decisions on how it will affect children, their education and training, um, attempting not to make disparaging remarks about other board members, Remembering 1.4 that as an, as an individual, you have no legal authority outside of the meetings of the board. Um, that your responsibility is not to operate the schools, but to see that they're well operated. Uh, to refer all complaints to the uh, proper authorities for resolution. To not criticize employees publicly. Once again, this is each board member will. I want to go back to that, that sentence that I referred to again. This is your policy and this is what you're required to follow as a, as a board member. You're gonna make decisions openly after the facts bearing uh, on a question have been presented. So don't come to board meetings ahead of time with a, done, with a decision in your mind. Um, be open, listen to the, the people that are presenting, listen to the data that's being presented, ask the good questions and then make your decisions. Confine board action to policy making, planning and appraisal or evaluation. Um, welcome, encourage the cooperation um, of uh, and participation of parents, students, and teachers and administrators um, in, and other personnel in developing your policies. And I think I gave a, a good example of, of how policies can be vetted by, um, by people that have to uphold them. It's, 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 it's very important that the people that have to uphold your policies and have to see that they're carried out are comfortable in, in, in how they and how they do so. Um, you're going to endeavor to seek financial support uh, within the capabilities of the community. So as much as you need to make sure that you provide the resources to support the educational programs in your school district, you also do have to keep an, an ear out to the capabilities of your community. Uh, you don't want to use your position to benefit yourselves. Um, you want to make sure that you attend every board meeting, a special meeting, and that you're prepared, you've read the materials, and um, and um, and sometimes you might just have some questions in your mind uh, that you might want to jot down to make sure you you're ready to ask those questions. And then you recognize that you're an agent of the state and you will abide by the laws of the state um, and the regulations formulated by the Department of Education, the State Board of Education and the federal government. So, as I call this, this is your job description. Now, some boards go as far as in the beginning of the school year. Um, or at some point in the year, they will review this policy and board members will actually sign the policy um, that I understand um, that these are the, uh, our code of ethics and I you know, will strive to abide by them, whatever the language is, and they'll sign their name and date it. And that, that becomes kind of a powerful joint um, collective agreement that yes, we stand by this policy and we will do everything we can to abide by the, the um, each, each uh, one of the um, recommendations in this policy. So that's something that I feel is very important. I think it really does summarize the roles and responsibilities of the school board. It also summarizes the uh, roles of school boards uh, and superintendents and their relationships. And it really does give you uh, 14 steps on what you're required to pay attention to and some do's and do and some things that you should and should not do as, as a board member. So that is your adopted uh, policy BCA and your code of ethics. So ethics and practice um, represent the entire district when making decisions, not just uh, your neighbor's friend or some that's complained to you or just remember that you have been uh, nominated, you've been elected to serve on the Scarborough School Board. And once that happened, you represent the entire district when making decisions. Understanding what your role is, understanding your uh, role of the school board, understanding the role of the relationship of the superintendent of the school board, understanding your code of ethics, um, and understanding um, that you have no authority as an individual and only when you act as a member of the board. Um, encourage, encourage an open exchange of ideas um, and have good conversations, have good discourse um, and be respectful of each other. Um, seek regular communications um, from obviously your superintendent keeping you up to date on what's going on uh, and also communicating with the public. Um, ethics and practice is working with other board members in a conscientious and courteous manner. Um, avoiding conflicts of interest, and if you can't, agree to disagree. You're not always going to agree on everything. Um, 
And so those are really what ethics and practice will look like. So if you look at the 14 points that I went over, um, this kind of summarizes them even a little bit more as far as if you're going to look at your code of ethics, what am I going to see you doing? I'm going to see you doing these things uh, as, as practice. Are there any questions? I haven't stopped yet. <laughs> And April, I'm I'm into um, what almost forty minutes, so <laughs> it won't be done. It won't be done. Alicia, in 40 Alicia <laughs> does have her little blue hand raised. Alicia, if you would like to go ahead. Thank you. Um, so Eileen, one of the questions that uh, I've had, and I um, I know that others have had as well, is. Um, recognizing that the chair is the spokesperson for the board um, and that we can't communicate outside of a board meeting to make decisions. Um, that, can, that can be difficult in practice um, when there are um, constituent emails or questions from the district and decisions need to be made. And I think that that um, creates a dynamic where potentially the, the chair is in a position where they have to make decisions um, without necessarily consulting with the board. What are your thoughts about that? So yeah, a couple great question, um, uh, Alicia. So the chair has no more power um, on the board than anyone else does. And no decision should be made outside of public meeting at all. So when constituents call, constituents email, I know you do have a policy or a procedure on how to handle constituents emails. Am I correct? Do I remember correctly that there is a policy procedure, a procedure I think it's called. Um, so, you know, when something comes to the board chair or something comes to a board member, you need to follow whatever process you have in place but there should be no decisions made outside the board and the, the board chair should be consulting with the superintendent on this has come my way. Um, how do you recommend that we move forward and have the superintendent might have to do some homework. He might have to do some investigation. He might have to ask some questions. So you need to let your superintendent do that groundwork. Um, and then if it's, a, if it's an issue that needs to come before the entire board, um, and if there, a decision uh, begs to be made, then it's done in a public meeting at the, at the board level. But, it, and it, it is hard, Alicia, because the public doesn't understand that. The public wants probably an answer sooner than later. Probably the best thing you can all have is thank you for bringing this to my attention. Um, I'm gonna bring this, I'm gonna talk to the superintendent about this and uh, we'll get back to you because, and. Sometimes the information is inaccurate. Sometimes it can be resolved at a very, very low level. Um, sometimes it doesn't require board um, board uh, interaction. Uh, and sometimes maybe it's just a, an update to the board at a further. So it really it depends on what the issue is. But but it's real clear that the board chair has has um, is no more doesn't have any more power than anyone else in the board. Um, they have specific roles that they do follow, uh, that they do uh, live up to, and that every decision that needs to be made needs to be made at the in, in public meeting. And that's by law um, and that's by statute. Thank you. Does that help? <laughs> okay, she didn't hear me. Um, so the next slide is, um, Alicia, duties of the chair. Um, so the duty of the chair assists the superintendent in the preparation of meeting agendas. And this, this is done, I think, I, I can't tell you how many different ways it's done, but from my experience, I would, I would put together the draft agenda um, based on uh, probably, you know, what month we we're in, what the topics needed to be brought up to you, what was coming our way from the legislature or uh, whatever, whatever the, the agenda was. And then I would pick up the phone uh, or sit down and meet with the, the board chair and go over the agenda and prepare the final agenda. Uh, the board chair will uh, chair, chair the school committee meetings. 
Um, the board chair assists in setting schedules for meetings, workshops like tonight. Um, April reached out to me and you know just confirmed that we were ready to go. Um, special meetings in conjunction with the superintendent. Um, unless other, otherwise agreed upon, is, is the official spokesperson for the school committee. And so when the board makes a decision, and this usually happens about really big, maybe controversial decisions or controversial you know, votes, uh, the board chair should sit down with the superintendent and say, okay, you know, we've just made the decision. We've got, you know, a little bit of the community is, is a little fractured on this. What are we, how, how are we, what is our message? As I said earlier, you want to have a consistent message from the superintendent and from the board chair. They want to work on that message together. You want it to be fat. You want it to be based on fact. You want it to be based on, um, on data. And, uh, and you want to make sure that your message is consistent because consistency is key to trust. Once again, as Alicia, as I said, the voice of the board chair is not the de facto opinion of the board. Um, so, um, and the decisions of the board need to be made by the board. So that kind of supports the concept that the board chair isn't any more powerful than, than the rest of the board. So the next two, and I'm just going to refer to these, and, and um, Diane, we don't have to blow them up, but the next, um, the next two, and these are in your handouts as well. Um, I call this the placemat. And actually, if you did it in the landscape, and what some board, uh, what some superintendents do is they will um, get them laminated. Go down to one of your elementary schools. I know every good elementary school in the state of Maine has a really good laminator. But this is really the code of ethics, your code of ethics, and Robert's rule. So the next, this slide and the next slide um, are back to back. Um, and quite often, um, they'll have them like this. And then we call it a placemat. One side is the code of ethics to remind you of what your code of ethics is. Um, you would probably want to align these to make sure that these align with the with your policy code of ethics. Um, on the left side, it has board notes about the legal requirements for school board meetings. Uh, what is the purpose of the Freedom of Information Act? Um, and for our new board members, this is a really good snapshot of some really good quick information. Um, how does public comment, uh, how does the public give comment? And we've updated that based on, on the law that was enacted in 2019. How can a board have good discussions given the restriction of open meeting law? On the right side, always asks. Uh, here are some sample questions you might want to refer to during a board meeting. And then um, kind of evaluating the board uh, as you have your meetings. Um, how do we spend our time? Uh, did all the board members have an opportunity to be heard? Uh, do we have enough information? So this is just kind of a kind of a cheat sheet of things to think about um, as you are in a board meeting. It kind of has a couple questions that you might want to consider using, um, and it also has your code of ethics. On the other side, um, and I'm not sure which. Yeah, go ahead back. Thanks. On the other side, it also has Robert's Rules of, of Order motions chart, and this Robert's Rules sometimes can be a little confusing on when you need a two-thirds vote, when you need a majority vote, um, when you can debate, when you can amend. Um, so here it says, if you want to close a meeting, you say, I move to adjourn. Uh, can you interrupt it? No. Can you second it? Yeah. I mean, so there, it just gives you what you can and cannot do. So it's a kind of a little cheat sheet um, um, for, for Robert's rules. Um, and then uh, a couple other board notes on the left-hand side. So a lot of boards do take this, they do put it in landscape, they get it laminated, and at your board meetings, you kind of have this. It's a great little reference um, during your board meeting. So I just wanted to point that out. I've heard a lot of boards of, do like having this resource uh, at their hands, at their fingertips during board meetings. So a uh, most common protocol um, boards can make is not understanding what the chair's uh, role is. Uh, for having, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna reiterate on this one, uh, for having uh, too many spokespersons without a consistent message, um, for allowing surprises. You know, if you, if you know something is bubbling out there, um, let the superintendent know. 
uh, let them know that someone might be coming. There might be, I've heard a couple of things about, you know, X, Y, and Z. Uh, we may be hearing about it in a board meeting. It's not, it, it, it just allows a superintendent to ask the questions that he needs to ask, to get the information he needs to have, and to be prepared to really kind of nip it in the bud at, and, 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 and really take care of an issue before maybe it becomes bigger than it needs to become. So if you do know something, um, look, give people the heads up. Uh, give them a chance to to look into what the, what may be coming their way. Um, the board chair needs to make sure that the, she requires recognition prior to speaking and not letting anyone just get up and speak and um, and making sure that there's proper respect and protocol by all, all board members at all times, making sure that everyone is heard, making sure people aren't interrupting each other um, and uh, forgetting that the conduct of the board during the meeting sends a message to the public. And this is something I feel really is really important. And if I look at my role as a teacher um, and, and the boards that I worked for and my role as a principal and the boards that I worked for and my role as a superintendent and the boards that I worked for, um, as it says in the next slide, how you conduct yourself and your business in the public eye goes a long way in determining your credibility and support in the community. So the community sees you using data from reliable sources and responsible sources if they and you're using data you're not making decisions based on hearsay um, if the community sees you having um, good discourse and agreeing to disagree and and making decisions and respecting each other um, if the community sees you coming to get to coming to board members well prepared um, and ready to to do the business um, in the best interest of the children if the community sees you putting the children at the forefront of every decision you make, every child um, um, of every decision you make, um, that goes, and, and if, the, if the community sees that you are consistent in your messaging, consistent in your communication, um, and that you're providing good thorough information to the community, that builds an incredible amount of trust from your community. Once again, you are overseeing your most important asset and it is the children of Scarborough. Um, and it doesn't take much for people to get really upset if they feel that their children or the children of Scarborough aren't in the forefront of every decision that you make. And I will speak from my experience as a teacher and a principal that when I worked for boards that were, um, were not collaborative, uh, you felt it, I felt it in the classroom. Um, I felt it as a teacher. I, I was never quite sure after a board meeting which way things may have gone and how it was gonna impact. You were kind of walking on eggshells. And I can also tell you as a teacher, when I worked for a board, where I worked in a school district with a board that worked collaboratively, that respected each other, that focused on students, that used data to make their decisions, that understood their authority or, or their lack of authority, depending on where they were, there was a sense of, of things were going well and there was a sense of support. As a teacher, I remember working in two very dis distinct districts and I'll say they were out of state. So, <laughs> um, but I do remember just feeling um, supported and I felt valued because the board was so focused on doing such a good job. I felt that in some way that came back and it made me feel valued as a teacher. So trust within the community trickles down the manner in which a board, board handles itself, manages itself, and conducts its business, that culture that you set at the board level, that trickles down into your schools. And it really does, it really does impact um, how people go about their day-to-day -day business. If they feel the board is focused, razor focused on doing their job, they're not gonna worry about what might happen. They're gonna be razor focused on doing their job. And I really feel that the collaboration and the culture that the board sets is, is seen in the schools. So I'm going to pause there because we're going to kind of do a little shift here. So any questions at all? Any of my student reps? I don't want to pick on you, but. Not seeing any hands, Eileen. All right. Well, okay. So email um, someday. I'm going to have the Ghostbusters sign, the red circle with the word email in the middle and the red slash and just say, just don't. 
I could, I could say, let's go on to the next slide, but let me, let me reiterate on this one a little bit. Um, as you know, email cannot be used as a substitute for deliberations of board meetings or for other communications, um, which were business should be confined to the board meetings. You should be aware that everything is considered a public record. So anything you put in an email uh, could be um, uh, requested as a public record. Uh, it has happened in Maine and you do have a policy um, regarding email and I think it's the next slide, Diane. So your policy BEA basically says you'll conform to the same standards of judgment, propriety and ethics as other forms of school board related communication. Uh, board members will comply with all the following guidelines. This is a policy, you're required to follow it. You will not use email for a substitute for deliberation at board meetings. Um, that you're aware that uh, email and attachments uh, can become uh, public records and inspected by law. You'll avoid reference of any confidential information about, uh, I mean, I, it says avoid. I would say will not reference, <laughs> um, avoid any confidential, uh, confidential information about employees. Um, you will use your email accounts for all school related business and you uh, are required to sign the employee computer internet use acknowledge form um, as indicated in your policies GCSA and GCSAR. I know email is convenient. I know you can get a lot of things accomplished in email, but um, your emails are considered a, a subject to public record. Um, the best use of emails for board members are, um, we are um, meeting at uh, September on November 19th at 5.30 for a board workshop, or we've had to move our meeting from this location to another, or someone's not gonna be able to make the meeting tonight, or a board member saying, I've got a sick child, I won't be able to make, make the meeting tonight, or I may attend it remotely because I can't be there in person when you do get back to person. Emails just, I've just seen so many emails that just verge on the, um, on the, on the side of deliberation, of making decisions before you get into meetings, asking other board members what they think about something, um, making decisions on how they're going to vote, and it has happened. So just keep in mind that once again, if the community I talked about the culture you set as a board. I talked about your, how you work collaboratively. Um, if you go into a board meeting and your decisions are made very quickly without much paying attention to data, people may think that you're starting to use email to, to or, or text messages. That's another, I mean, any, any form, and I should probably update this, um, any form of uh, communication um, that, uh, that could become part of public record. So, be very careful with email um, and I think the next uh, and, and be very careful with social media when you um, actually if you have a Facebook page or if you're on Instagram or TikTok or, or whatever is the, the latest wave right now, um, it, you're on as an individual, although Gabby, did I say something funny? <laughs> I see Alicia laughing. We were laughing um, at TikTok. <laughs> I think we were all just picturing each other trying to figure out how to use TikTok, Eileen. <laughs> well, I was, I, I, at the last board workshop, someone said, what about TikTok? So now I'm adding it in there. So, <laughs> um, but the other thing is the use of social media. Um, just remember that when you are on social media, you are on as an individual, you are not on as a board member. So do not use social media to weigh in on school activities, to weigh in on school discussions. If you see a discussion on social media going on by your friends or um, please don't weigh in because as much as you're weighing in as an individual, they see you weighing in as a board member. And then they're gonna say, wow, the board feels this way. Even if just one of you weighs in, that, that, that gets translated and well, the board felt this way. So. It, it, I know it doesn't seem fair, um, but as a board member, because you are an individual, but most of the public doesn't see you as as an individual outside of the bu of the boardroom. They see you as a as a as a um, as a board member. So, just be careful on social media. Um, if you um, 
you know, see something positive, like, oh, it was a great beginner band concert last night. And yeah, it was awesome. That's appropriate. But um, there's a lot of discourse about um, issues in schools on social media. And as a board member, I strongly recommend that you don't weigh in because as much as you may be thinking you're weighing as an individual, it's going to be seen that the Scarborough School Board weighed in and they feel this way. And, that, and that's just how social media, those are just the domino effects of social media. So um, electronic, use of electronics to communicate um, your, um, and those are my dogs, if you can hear them, uh, to, um, should be used just to uh, who, what, where, um, and when. Uh, and and when I mean who, it's like we will be meeting at this time. So just be very careful with social media. It it has, um, it has caused some some districts some really serious um, and significant problems. And and um, you've worked too hard to come together as a board to let that interfere with with the work that you're doing. So any questions on that? Okay, thanks. Uh, so confidentiality. One of the most important things uh, you are required to do is to be confidential on a variety of, of uh, issues. Um, so confidentiality falls to employment matters. Um, applicants, uh, when, you're, when you're applying, if the board sits on uh, interview committees, uh, the applicants that apply for jobs in your district, uh, that information is all confidential. Uh, the interviews uh, and who is interviewed is all confidential and any reference information contained in a candidate packet is also uh, confidential. Obviously, everything in executive session is confidential. And then when we get to those quasi-judicial matters, matters where we're talking about possibly a, a dismissal or a uh, expulsion hearing, everything that's contained in that, that hearing is confidential. And I mean confidential forever, not just while you're a board member, but these items are confidential forever. So in executive session, um, items that may be discussed uh, are obviously employment, appointment, assignment, duties, promotion, demotion, uh, compensation, evaluation, uh, disciplining, resignation. Of course, you, there are certain rules that when you are disciplining, you, the, the, there are employee rights that are attached to some of these, uh, these items uh, that you need to make sure your superintendent and the school board is following. Uh, resignation or dismissal of public officials, appointees or employees of the, uh, the body or agency. And then in order to go in, um, executive session items that can also be um, discussed, obviously expulsion or suspension of a student. And that would, if you had to deal with a quasi judicial matter, matter with an expulsion or suspension of a student, all of that would be done in executive session. You can discuss condition or acquisition of, or use of real or personal property only if, um, if you did so in public it would prejudice the, prejudice the competitive um, bargaining of the body or agency. So if you were talking about, for example, buying, you know, purchasing a piece of land, if you did that in public session, maybe, maybe someone listening would find out what you're thinking of, how much you were thinking of put, bidding on it or, or making a bid on it, and that would prejudice that, that process. So that's when, um, that's when uh, acquisition uh, or use of real or personal property uh, would be appropriate in executive session. However, general budget matters should not be discussed at all in executive session. So how do I go into executive session? Um, in, on the agenda and in your, in your handouts, there are, um, I, I provide you with the statutes uh, that um, are required to be used. Um, having been at many of your board meetings, I'm very, um, I'm very, I know that you're very well versed and what statutes need to be used to go into executive session. So as your superintendent and your board chair pre uh, prepare the agenda, if they uh, are expecting to have an executive session, they will, uh, they will look to have the appropriate statute listed that will define uh, the uh, citation uh, that allows you to go in. And that basically uh, explains to the public uh, based on that statute why you're going into executive session. Uh, then you'll start with a public motion to go in. 
It will pass with a recorded vote of three fifths of the members present and voting. Um, and now uh, due to COVID, uh, this can be done um, virtually as well with present means present at the meeting, whether in person or uh, virtually. Um, and you state the precise nature of the business in the motion, including the cit citation from statute. Um, it's very, very important. And I know um, so, and from my own experience, um, sometimes, you, you know, once an executive session, it's like, oh, while we're in, can we talk about, please don't put your superintendent in that, in that corner. Um, you are required by law to only discuss what you have gone in based on the, the statute that you cited. So only matters stated in a motion may be considered. Um, if you have more than one executive session or more than one item to go into executive session, my strong recommendation is you go in under um, one uh, citation uh, to discuss uh, uh, is situation, once you've finished discussing that, you will go back out. If you have another reason to go into executive session, you go back in using that statute and then you come out. So you don't wanna lump all the citations together. I think it's very transparent that you do it one at a time. And that way the community is saying, okay, they're going in um, to um, talk about, and I've got the statutes in front of me, um, going to go in under, uh, there's a motion to go uh, into executive session under MRSA uh, section 405-6C, uh, and that applies to the real or personal property attached uh, discussion. Um, uh, and uh, you've had that discussion, you're finished, and, and you come out. However, you've got another uh, um, another uh, reason to go back into executive session and that's gonna be uh, the assignment of officials or employees. And that's gonna be statute MRSA 4056A. Um, and so you go in under that. So it makes it very clear that we have two or three reasons to go into executive session. We're not lumping them all together and we're, we're following the law and we're being transparent in, in the way we do this. There are districts that do lump them together and, and that's fine. My, um, my request is that board members say, while we're in here, we do not try to say, while we're here, let's talk about something else because your, your board is, your super is gonna have to say, no, we're not allowed to do that. And um, so I always ask boards not to put your superintendent in that corner. Um, the restrictions are only matters stated and a motion may be considered. Um, no official actions shall be finally approved uh, in executive session and no public record shall be kept. So these are the restrictions of executive session. Are there any questions about executive session? I do. Oh, sorry, yeah. Alicia doesn't have her hand up. Yep, go ahead, Alicia. Thank you. Um, so Eileen, I've got a question. If, if there's something that uh, seems to be a problem and you can't really communicate it by any form outside of a board meeting, but you also can't really be critical in a board meeting. How, how are you supposed to handle that? I'm trying to think of an example, and I'm not gonna ask you to give me one. Um, if there's a problem, I would recommend that it's brought to the superintendent's attention. And you, it's similar to, my answer is gonna be similar to how I answered you before, is that if there's a problem, and we're actually we're gonna get into handling public con concerns and complaints next. Um, if there's a problem, it, it should be going to the superintendent. If you know a, something that's, that's becoming a problem or you're hearing about it, it should go to the superintendent. Your policy requires that you resolve those issues at the lowest common denominator. If it doesn't get low, resolved the lowest common denominator. So let's say I, Eileen King, I teach Spanish and I'm, my class is unruly. I have no classroom management at all. The kids are running all over the place. And um, you know, you're really concerned about what's going on in the classroom. So what would happen is you would go to your superintendent saying, I, I'm, I, I'm hearing this, I'm hearing this once. And, and if someone comes to you, Alicia, you say, thank you very much for bringing it to my attention. I'll bring it to the attention of the superintendent. Superintendent's gonna bring it to the attention of um, the principal. And I'm hoping the principal is going to 
call the parent and, and try to encourage the parent to talk to the teacher. If the parent doesn't feel comfortable, then maybe the principal and the parent and the teacher sit down and talk about it. Um, if it doesn't get resolved, then it will go to the superintendent or the assistant superintendent. And if it doesn't get resolved, then it goes to the superintendent. And then in, in a situation much more serious than what I just described, um, it can go to the board at some level and it would probably go into executive session at some level under an appropriate statute, but problems should be should be handled at the lowest level possible. And so you want to seek resolution at the lowest level possible. Um, but anything you hear, I would definitely bring to the superintendent. Um, the superintendent's probably going to call the board chair and say, just so you know, I'm hearing this and this is what I'm going to do. And then if, if they can resolve it, it's resolved. And if not, there are ways and there's your policy that talks about how you must, what, what steps you need to take to resolve whatever problem it is. And it is hard when you can't talk openly about things, but it's also, there's a, there are reasons for it as well. Um, and um, to make sure that the data that everyone's getting is, is, is accurate. So um, you keep bringing me into, into the next slide I'm going to. I don't know if you're looking ahead and you're just- No, I'm not, but thank you. <laughs> so public concerns and complaints, you want to seek them at the lowest resolution possible. Um, if not resolved, you appeal the decision to the next level. Um, so whether it's a, you know, a teacher and then to a principal, maybe to supervisor of buildings and grounds, either special ed director, uh, transportation director, however it is set up in your district. And every district is different as far as um, what the different levels uh, what are as far as um, administration or as far as is uh, management and responsibility. If it's still not resolved after you've gone through a variety of steps, then it can be appealed to the superintendent. And if it's still unresolved, the, the matter can be placed on the school board agenda. And nine times out of 10, I would probably say almost 99.9% .9 of the times that would go into executive session so that whatever the issue was, um, you would be protecting um, public discourse about a student. We well, wouldn't want to have that in public. Uh, you certainly would be, uh, there are employee rights that you'd have to be honoring as well. So um, when you do have a concern or complaint, um, the next slide, uh, Diane, uh, ask the person if they've discussed the issue uh, with the person immediately responsible. Have you talked to the teacher? Have you talked to the principal? Have you talked to the coach? Have you talked to the bus driver? Um, whoever it is. Uh, thank them for uh, presenting uh, the concern. Please don't say you're gonna take care of it because you have no authority to do so. And you can't take care of it and you shouldn't take care of it, but uh, encourage the person to follow and establish the process that you have in place. And also let them know that you're gonna let the superintendent know because you want, you know, you're concerned about what you've heard and you wanna make sure um, that, you know, you, that we look into it. Um, so I think that's, it's very important that one of my biggest pet peeves as superintendent is when something was festering out there and I didn't know about it. Because if I didn't know about it, I couldn't pick up the phone. I couldn't ask the questions I needed to ask. I couldn't follow up on it. Um, and sometimes the information we get is not accurate. And um, sometimes there's the rest of the story that's omitted and with the complaint or the concern. So giving your superintendent, your principals, your assistant superintendent, the ability to do their investigation, to do their research and to get to the bottom of the story is only fair to them. Um, and, and quite often by giving them that information, as I said, they can nip things in the bud sooner than, or sooner than later. And it keeps it from kind of mushering into a, a bigger issue or a bigger situation than it needed to be in the beginning. So that communication back and forth is, is very, very important. Um, and then uh, public concerns and complaints. I did think we threw in our sample policy. Um, and you have your own, but we threw this one in. Uh, and I think let's go to your, is this? Um, all right, so we do have, this is our policy for public concerns and complaints, um, is that the parents, students, or other citizens with complaints or concerns regarding any aspect uh, of the school uh, or employee thereof shall be encouraged to seek a resolution to the lowest possible level. So this is a policy that MSMA 
recommends that, that school districts take, take a look at. Such complaints should be addressed to the board chair and most policies say and or the superintendent. Um, if the complaint cannot be resolved at the lowest level, the person initiating the complaint may appeal the decision to the next level. And that's something we just talked about. Um, it then can be appealed to the superintendent and if it's still unresolved, it can be taken up at the next school board meeting. Uh, so this is a policy um, that has been used on, in other districts that I want to make sure that you are aware that, that, that we had in, in place. Um, the next policy, which kind of supports, let me go back and, and, and let me just, are there any questions about the public handling of public concerns and complaints? So the next policy is the public participation at school board meetings. And um, in, uh, in 19, uh, 2019, uh, LD 721 was um, adopted uh, an act to encourage public participation in school board meetings. And this is requiring the school board meetings have a comment, uh, have a public comment period, which um, when we surveyed all of our boards, I think all but four in the in the state did. So uh, this was not a new procedure, a new process, but it, it did kind of give some um, expectations to public comment that a school board shall provide the opportunity for the public to comment on school and education matters at a school board meeting. But then it says nothing in the subsection restricts the board from establishing reasonable standards for the, uh, the public comment period, including time limits and conduct standards. So you might say you have three minutes um, that you can speak. You can only speak twice to the same issue um, and you are required to be respectful and, and, um, and that will be determined by the board chair. Uh, for purpose of the subsection, the school board meeting means a full meeting of the school board and it does not include uh, meetings of subcommittees. So there are no required public comment uh, meetings at the subcommittee meetings, uh, but there are required comments. So um, your board chair uh, may, if there's a topic that you're expecting a lot of public comment, you might have a sign up sheet where people can put down their name. Um, their their address and what they're the topic of what they're going to talk about. Um, the board chair can uh, determine uh, a limitation on how long people can speak, how often they can speak, um, and the board chair is going to have to control public comment to ensure that um, the the rights of your of of your employees are are not violated, um, and that the proper decorum is maintained at all times. Uh, so um, I just want to make sure, and you have policy BEDH, which does talk about uh, the um, public comment period. Uh, and um, once again, uh, it talks about carrying out the official business. So your board members are for you to carry out the official business of the school board. Um, they're not to be controlled by the public, but you do want to hear from the public and you do want to have them weigh in on, on concerns. I was at a meeting last night and there was a big discussion about snow days and whether they should have snow days or whether they should be remote learning days. And, and um, that was a, about a 25 minute uh, public comment <laughs> discussion. Um, the board recognizes the value of public comment on educational issues to permit fair and orderly expression of such comment and the procedures described in this policy will be followed. So you already have procedures in this policy um, and the board will ask uh, members of the public to comment prior to board action on agenda items dealing uh, with policy. Um, and I'm, I'm not gonna read through all these, but um, the board chair is, re is required to recognize a speaker uh, and you can limit uh, their comments uh, to the item under discussion um, the, the speaker should not expect the board or the superintendent to answer questions during public comment because quite often you don't know, sometimes you know what they're going to comment on, so you're not prepared to do that. Um, however, you do want to make sure that you there, thank them for their, their, um, their comment. Um, and then uh, all speakers must observe rules of etiquette. Uh, the board chair may set time limit on the length of public comment and or limit for individual speakers. And then the board chair will stop any public comment that is contrary to these rules. So the board chair should have a pretty clear understanding um, of what the uh, roles and responsibilities are when it comes to public comment and, and how to handle um, public comment uh, at a public board meeting. So, 
So I think we are kind of wrapping up a little bit. Um, and I'm right on time. Uh, one of the things we want to talk about is the six key attributes of board members. Um, you want to think strategically and ana analytically uh, and to effect effectively communicate your thoughts and the reasons for them. Um, you uh, pos a possession of earned respect of other key stakeholder group members, uh, the ability to work well uh, with others as a member of a collaborative group with group decision making authority and the understanding of your fiduciary duties of loyalty, care and, and obedience. Um, demonstrated understanding of the differences between oversight and super, oh, supervision. Uh, a reputation for maturity, personal integrity, and honesty. Um, those go a long way in how the public will see uh, how you function as a board. Um, and then a familiarity with the body of knowledge related to both the process for which the group is responsible, as well as the substantive content uh, and of the subject area within the decisions and the choices that will be made. And this is basically saying what I said in the very beginning, uh, having reliable data from responsible resources. Um, so there's a couple, there's a couple one-liners I want you to come away with tonight. Reliable data from responsible resources and no authority as an individual. I think those are like, you know, two, two key takeaways tonight or, or kind of quick, you know, quick um, um, thoughts to, to always keep in the back of your mind. Uh, is this reliable data from a responsible resource? I have no authority as an individual outside of the boardroom. Uh, understanding your uh, code of ethics, understanding the statute that uh, prescribes what you are required to do, uh, your role, school board roles and responsibilities, understanding the roles and responsibilities uh, between the school board and the superintendent um, are all very, very important as you move forward as a school board member. Um, I think there are a couple other things that there are some studies that were, were conducted um, uh, based on the um, school board actions that they do matter, um, that there is a positive relationship between effective boardsmanship and student achievement, um, and that it comes from responsible school, school governance. It's because you have high student expectations. It's holding the district and the superintendent accountable and yourselves accountable. Yourselves accountable for following your code of ethics. Yourselves accountable for following your policies yourselves accountable for following the statute as it relates to the board's response roles and responsibilities. Um, it's uh, also uh, speaks to high to engaging your community and creating conditions for student and staff success. So accountability and governments are highly high, high governance are highly relevant as far as you look at how school board matters act, actions matter. Ugh, need my water. So eight traits of effective school boards, um, having high expectations. Uh, I know you have goal setting meetings, having clear goals um, and believing that all, and let me go back to the goals a little bit. Um, make sure less is more. Have three goals that are attainable. Don't have eight with, that aren't um, because then you never feel like you've accomplished something. So really look at what your priorities are. Um, one of the boards I work for always had um, they had three major goals and then two, we didn't call them minor because they were important, but we had three priority goals. Let me put it that way. And if we got through the three priority goals, then we had goal four that if we had time to address and goal five, we would work on, but immediately goal four and goal five would be called, we come goal one and two the, the next year, unless something else came up. So but we also positioned ourselves that let's set up goals that we can actually work on, that we can attain and feel that we've accomplished. And our goals went for 18 months. We didn't do it for a school year. We didn't do it for 12 years. We usually did it for 18 months to make sure we had time to be thoughtful and, and to have the resources and the time to plan and the time to um, really work together on those goals. Um, believing that all children can learn is key um, to everything you do. And when I say um, all children can learn, I mean all children, um, regardless of their strengths and their challenges. Focusing on student achievement, um, being a collaborative board with uh, effective communication, being data savvy, that goes back to uh, responsible information from reliable sources, 
Um, make sure your goals and your resources are aligned. So don't have goals that you're not going to fund. Don't have goals that you want someone to carry out that you're not going to give them the resources to, to be successful. You want team leadership. Uh, and as here's an example of team training tonight. We're all sitting down. We're, you're working together. Um, you're bringing in your new board members and uh, you're um, reminding yourselves about your roles and responsibilities of, of being an effective board, board member. And the last thing I want to talk about, no, I've got a couple more slides. So the next slide is the school board evaluation. Uh, I did include uh, the, B, uh, the policy sample BBAB. Um, why evaluate? You know, take time to talk about what you do well. Uh, we have several sample uh, board evaluations that we can send your way that you can take a look at. But really, you need to provide yourselves with feedback on how are we functioning as a board? What are we doing well? What do we need to work on? That should be part of your goal setting um, as well. Uh, using that information to, to move forward and to make decisions. And also, as I said earlier, allowing the school, the superintendent to weigh in on what works for him and, and what sometimes is problematic. And, 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 and that is very important in developing that relationship of trust and, and that, that collaborative relationship that is so important to high functioning boards. That, that is a sample policy I'm not gonna get into right now, but I wanted to throw it into your, um, your, uh, um, your packet and uh, something that if you don't have a policy for, uh, for board evaluation, it might be something you might wanna look at, you might wanna consider. And I will stop at this point. And, oh, I'm three minutes shy of my hour and a half, April. Any questions? Oh, in your packet, there is a, I think there's a feedback form. <laughs> There is. Oh, darn. <laughs> I thought I took that out. Uh, seriously, uh, if you want to provide feedback, it's always very helpful for me to get the feedback. Um, and, um, and you can just give it to uh, Sandy or Kelly and they can um, scan it over to me. Okay. So are there any questions? I know for the new board members, I know your heads must be swimming. Um, especially uh, Shannon, you know, Kristen's probably going, okay, yep, this, some, some of this makes sense. Uh, but uh, really uh, look at your policy, your section B right now, uh, as far as uh, that really pertains to board governance and, and some of the, the school board roles and responsibilities. Um, I threw a lot of information at you. I, I really hope I focused on the responsibilities of the board, of the superintendent roles and responsibilities and um, some, key issues that you tend to deal with more often than not. So if you have any questions, uh, send them uh, my way. Uh, usually my card is in the packet. I'm not sure it's there. So it's eking at msmaweb.com. Um, let me think. Uh, Sarah knows how to get in touch with me. Leanne knows how to get in touch with me. April, Alicia. Uh, Sandy and Nick and Diane, so, um, and, and Kelly. So uh, if you have any questions or you wanna follow up or um, think about something uh, that I didn't mention or um, anything at all, please uh, send me an email. I'll make sure I'll get back to you. It was a pleasure uh, seeing all of you again. I'm sorry, it's not in person. I look forward to when we can get back to doing this in person. Uh, but uh, unless there are questions, I know you have a a meeting following this, am I correct? Yeah. Yeah. I hope I didn't cut into your snack time. Oh, maybe only just a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Eileen, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's always a jam packed hour and a half. Um, and I'll make sure that we um, follow up with you if anyone does have questions. Great, so my pleasure and have a great night. Everyone stay safe and have a great Thanksgiving. Oh, thank you, you too. Thank you.